to actually create this thing. The issue could be ignored no longer. We'd been planning big government for a long time, and the site would either happen now or it wouldn't. I reached out to one of the only money people I knew, told her what we were up to, and told her we needed help. She turned me down flat. She was afraid of the Alinsky playbook, the Richard Mellon Scaife treatment in particular. She has a family, has some public exposure. I couldn't blame her. In her position, who wouldn't be afraid? It was then I made up my mind. I boldly declared to Larry, let's put our money where our mouth is. Larry said, okay, but what money? Or rather, let's put my dad's money where our mouth is. Yep, I went to daddy. I told dad I needed to borrow $25,000 to kick off a website, that it could be a very big thing in my career, whatever that career actually was, and that I would never ask him for anything like it again. He didn't ask questions, God bless him. He just ponied up and wished me luck. I doubt he had any expectations of ever seeing that money again, a lot of money, frankly, to a retired restaurateur. But Dad came through. He wasn't afraid. Yes, we've since paid him back. And we were rolling. The day after James came to my house with the Baltimore video... I took a once-in-a-lifetime week off to be a Lincoln Fellow at the Claremont Institute. It is basically a program where you sit around in a luxury hotel and learn about the founders from some of the world's best thinkers on American history. Because of my, somewhat understated, approach to academics during college, I now function in a sort of guilty, read-everything mode born of guilt. So the opportunity to be taught about the Founding Fathers by people like Harry Jaffa filled a void left by an American Studies experience at Tulane that had really been a major in anti-American studies. The Claremont program was fantasy baseball camp for constitutional junkies, and packing to go, I couldn't have been more excited. I did everything but bring a James Madison lunchbox. I checked into the beautiful island hotel in Newport Beach on a warm summer day, feeling like a kid at camp. As soon as I checked into the room, thinking about the pool and the bar more than Thomas Jefferson just then, I got a call from a guy named Patrick Corielsch. Now, I had just read a piece in Reason magazine by Corielsch. Patrick is an artist who started off as a liberal and moved toward libertarianism. Talk about an apostate to the left. Patrick's former partner is Shepard Ferry, the guy who designed the Obama Hope poster. His reason piece suggested that his brethren in the art world needed to diversify their ideological holdings, that it was just flat-out boring for everyone to think and create according to the same leftist orthodoxy. Reading his piece, I recognized that at the most basic level, that was my argument about the larger culture, too. This is boring. For everybody to have the exact same PC point of view reinforcing the growth of the state runs so contrary to what artists should be about, which is challenging conformity. Yet, in 2009, conservatives, libertarians, and other rebels found themselves in this ideological ghetto. For a while after I'd read his piece, Patrick and I had been corresponding. Talking to him now from Claremont, he casually mentioned that he had received an email from the National Endowment for the Arts. It was an invitation to a conference call hosted by the NEA, the White House Office of Public Engagement, and a group called United We Serve. According to the email, the call was designed to bring together a group of artists, producers, promoters, organizers, influencers, marketers, tastemakers, leaders, or just plain cool people to work together to promote a more civilly engaged America and celebrate how the arts can be used for a positive change. Patrick asked me whether he should tape it. I told him, absolutely. That was because James O'Keefe had already changed my thinking. I had always been a text-based guy. I had founded Breitbart.tv, but that was merely a video aggregator. James had shown me that tape was the most damaging evidence you could have. The conference call took place three days later. And on that conference call, members of the White House staff and the NEA openly asked artists to help promote the Obama agenda. And Corey Elsh had it on tape. 
If you think about it, the timing was crazy. If you're a conservative and you pay attention to the conservative news cycle, you know that huge stories are relatively rare. And here was a huge story in Acorn and a pretty big story in the NEA, back to back. Had these been liberal-oriented news items, they would have been presented as somewhere between VJ Day and the moon landing. Some reporters dine out on a story they did 40 years ago, and to put these two stories together at the exact same moment, both of them representing the Democrat media complex's corruption and propagandizing and ends justify the means tactics, it was a breakthrough moment for the new media. I'm not a religious man, but if anything makes me believe in divine providence, it was that convergence. Because this was the moment. Monica Lewinsky had started it. Swift Boat had continued it by end-running around the media and keeping Kerry out of office. Dan Rather had lost his job. And Clark Hoyt of the New York Times would soon admit that the mainstream media were late to the party on Van Jones. But in my mind, it seemed that if the Acorn story and the NEA story could be paired and weaponized, maximized and forced into the eye of the American public, they could serve as a case study demonstrating that the new media could supplant ye old media. These paired stories could serve as notice that if the mainstream wouldn't take helpful hints to right the ship, they were going to experience something akin to a mutiny. I felt like Fletcher Christian with an impending case of carpal tunnel. Incidentally, I was thinking in these grandiose, metaphorically violent terms, in these revolutionary terms, really, because I was simultaneously being taught about the Founding Fathers and the risks that they took and the stakes that were in play during the American Revolution. While the other Lincoln fellows were sitting there writing notes furiously, like the brilliant academics that they were, these were the next Newt Gingriches or Antonin Scalia's or Clarence Thomas's of the world. I was sitting there with my new media mind taking it all in like it was Avatar in 3D. I started listening to the stories of the Founding Fathers, the conditions that they found themselves in, their interactions with the monarchy and their fellow citizens. I heard that they were a loose band of malcontents who didn't have a mass movement behind them. And I realized that right in front of me, right in front of me, I had the same opportunity at a critical time in our nation's history to go against the grain and to fight a revolution against the complex. I had a chance to exploit a crack that had been growing in the mainstream media with the exposure of the Democratic Party media collusion. I had a chance to demonstrate that the complex is a unitary, tyrannical organism that serves to suffocate those who disagree with its collective worldview and silly utopian aphorisms. Call it delusions of grandeur. Call it the walking out of Rocky syndrome, where you shadow box the air after you see the film, feeling like a giant dork, but also feeling you can take on the world. The Claremont Institute inspired me to realize that I had an obligation to fight the battle against the oppression and total control of the national airwaves by the champagne class who seek to build a false and demeaning narrative of what America is and what it should be, who trample on the First Amendment with their Frankfurt School philosophy and Alinsky tactics. The battle against them was a righteous cause, I was certain and I recognized that by whatever accident of circumstance, I was well-trained and well-positioned for this battle against them, a battle that would take place in the new media theater of war. And it was my obligation to take up those weapons at my disposal. I left Claremont prepared for combat. I would need to be. A plan took shape. The release of the Corielsch tape created an online and talk radio sensation and forced the resignation of an NEA appointee. As predicted, the mainstream media did their best to ignore it. It was new media, including Big Hollywood, that forced the Obama administration to finally do some damage control and take some action. It was an excellent softening up, the one in the one-two punch we were planning. It did its job. Now for the haymaker. Of course, I knew the press wasn't going to give credit where it was due on the Acorn story and that they wouldn't believe that the plan hadn't all been preconceived. So I took precautions in my Washington Times column released September 7, 2009, the Monday before we launched the story. 
The piece followed hard on the heels of the Van Jones story. Jones, Obama's appointed green czar, as well as a celebrated communist and 9-11 truther, had stepped down on September 5th because of conservative media pressure from Glenn Beck, Breitbart.tv, and others. Beck, by the way, already knew about the Acorn videos at this point. When I showed them to him, he told me, You need a bodyguard. Clark Hoyt had written that the New York Times had to pay more attention to the conservative media, that the mainstream media had ignored the Van Jones story until it crawled up and bit them on the ass, when Jones was ultimately forced to resign. Despite that, I knew they were going to ignore the Acorn story, too, despite their newfound commitment to a wider news angle. So I wrote a column entitled, Couric Should Look in Mirror. In it, I laid out the entire plan, getting it into the public record as evidence that I had warned the mainstream media what was coming. In the column, I mentioned the NEA story and I mentioned Acorn. Then I gave them the big clue. When the next big scandal hits, and it will, and it most certainly won't come from traditional journalism, all eyes will be on Pinch Sulzberger, New York Times publisher Arthur O. Sulzberger, Jr., to see if he does his job. All eyes are on the media. We are judging them by the standard they taught us during Watergate. The cover-up is worse than the crime. The timing was carefully chosen, and with the backdraft of Jones and Hoyt, sailing conditions were ideal. We launched the week Barack Obama was trying to reset the conversation on health care. This was one month after the violent town hall experiences in which a finger was bitten off in Thousand Oaks by a crazed Obama follower, where a black guy was called the N-word and was beaten up by two service employees, International Union, SEIU, thugs. At this point, Obama wanted to reframe the health care debate because his original effort had been a muddled failure. Obama was due to make his unprecedented speech to all school children on Tuesday, September 8th. The next day, he was set to address a joint session of Congress on health care, all in an attempt to create a fake groundswell where the following conversation would take place between America's kids and their parents. Mommy, Mommy, the President spoke. He's so wonderful. Please do whatever it takes to make his presidency a success. Yes, darling. I shall support health care reform, because the day after you heard the president in school, I heard him on television telling me that government-controlled health care is the most important thing in the world, even though every poll shows the American people want jobs and economic recovery rather than a new multi-trillion dollar entitlement. Hey, isn't that Joy Behar wonderful? I had learned from John McCain choosing Sarah Palin the day after Obama's Invesco speech the speech with the Greek columns, the speech that was supposed to announce Obama's godlike ascent to power, one of the biggest speeches of all time, that you could suck the air out of the room with a breaking, well-timed story. The day after Invesco, nobody was talking about Invesco. Everybody was talking about Palin. And I knew that for the Obama phenomenon to continue, media control was everything. Here was a construct whom the mainstream covered on a routine basis, whom they never vetted, who was in fact elected by them through platitudes and misdirection. That's why it never crossed my mind whether I should play fair. Fair loses. So my goal was to allow Obama to speak on Wednesday night before the joint session of Congress, then drop the first Acorn video early Thursday morning, so that instead of the American public spending the day at the water cooler asking each other, Did you see the health care speech? Don't you feel healthier already? They'd spend the day asking each other, Holy shit, did you see that Acorn video? We dropped the first video Thursday, the second one Friday. I knew also that on Saturday, September 12th, the 9-12 project and the Tea Party movement were planning rallies all over the country, including a massive rally in Washington, D.C. So we'd get an early litmus test. In places like Quincy, Illinois, and Washington, D.C., we'd be able to see how ordinary Americans were reacting to the scandal. There was still, however, the question of which videos to release. I wanted to launch the Baltimore and Washington tapes in close proximity to each other so that Acorn and its allies would think these kids had done only a regional hit. 
It would never occur to them that this story had coast-to-coast -coast implications, that these kids had done something far wider in scope. If I had released the videos from Baltimore and Los Angeles, I figured they would have known the extent of their problem. I also wanted to give them a chance to float the inevitable a few bad apples defense. So by making the story regional, I was sandbagging them. But as we neared launch date, I was worried. We had the what and the when, but the big issue of where we should launch still loomed. As much as I wanted to exclusively use the web-based new media, I wasn't sure I could rely on the acorn scandal trickling up from just big government, YouTube, and the viral internet. I knew this ground-up strategy might not work, because the complex had crafted a response to viral stories. Media matters. In an effort to act as a firewall to protect the left from acorn-like stories, and in response to the success of groups like the Swift Boat Vets, the mainstream media had created a rear-protecting unit, Media Matters. Its workers, senior fellows as they like to be called, are generally white, web-savvy young guys. Media Matters raises a lot of money, seven to ten million dollars per year, to nitpick a story to death delegitimizing it, isolating it, and then claiming it has been debunked. The content at Media Matters is then repeated all over the left-wing media, from the networks to MSNBC and CNN to the New York Times as received wisdom. I knew Media Matters and its ilk could kill off a story before it got started by nitpicking it in its infancy. And let's be honest here, I wasn't dealing from strength, though I had the truth. James O'Keefe and Hannah Giles weren't professional filmmakers. I didn't have a 30-person staff of reporters or a personal staff or a PR team. So a viral, web-based rollout, however attractive, couldn't be risked. I had to hit overwhelmingly from all angles. I needed the tsunami. And I needed it to build to the point that it swamped the Media Matters breaching wall and washed right into the newsrooms. Then the mainstream media would have to deal with the fact that they were wet and the water was rising. I should mention that as clever or obvious as all this might sound, in retrospect, there was no shortage of those who disagreed with me. I had, in fact, showed the videos to a couple of prominent old-school journalists, and they both told me that the plan was a loser, that I needed to drop the videos neutron bomb style in one place and all at once. They were also worried about the techniques James and Hannah had used, but talking to them actually strengthened my conviction. Their objections sounded musty, outdated, and I realized that on this one I was going to ignore the advice of my elders and betters. I would stick to the drip, drip, drip from everywhere strategy I was so convinced would work. It was time to get started. I began by giving the old guard a fair shot. After all, they were still the prevailing power, and I couldn't really gripe if they didn't cover a story they hadn't known about. So I approached a contact at ABC News and showed him the videos. He was blown away. But then he told me ABC News would never run it because it was too political. I felt vindicated already. Next, I approached one of my contacts at Fox News. I told him about the Acorn story and simply handed him a copy of the tapes. I didn't tell him what to do with it. I simply said, This is what we're going to do on big government, and we're going to give you the full audio and video. You can do whatever you want with it. And you can ask James O'Keefe whatever you wish. Now, I didn't just do this because I wanted the story to break on Fox News, even though I did. I did it because I believe that Roger Ailes and Rupert Murdoch wouldn't launch a story of this magnitude without having the massive legal authority of Fox check to see whether everything was legit. Handing it to Fox News gave me my highest level of confidence. I had a small business running out of a basement. They had a billion-dollar entertainment conglomerate. They were better equipped than I was to ensure that everything was on the straight and narrow. And somewhere in the back of my mind... I still had to worry that maybe I was being punked, and that this was all a giant scheme, that maybe James hadn't told me the whole truth, and that I was the target of an even grander plot. Giving the video to Fox News was like enlisting your tough older brother against a pack of schoolyard bullies. Still, 
I went to sleep that night with an inkling that something might go wrong. My biggest fear was that Fox would have second thoughts and refuse to launch it, and we'd lose our tsunami. My second biggest fear, which rose in paranoid moments late in the night, was that Fox would refuse to run it because they had discovered it was a scam and that I was the rube who'd been taken. At five o'clock in the morning, I got a phone call from my contact at Fox News. There's a problem, he said. It was supposed to launch at six with Megyn Kelly. It broke this morning on Fox and Friends. I couldn't even pretend to be upset. Larry and I had been so stressed about launching this story, about having dotted all our I's and crossed all our T's, fearful all the time that something would go seriously wrong, and now I was being told Fox had run with it first thing that morning. It was the equivalent of your wife going into labor two days before the due date and the doctor apologizing for handing you a perfect baby 48 hours early. Our response wasn't angst. It was exultation. The Fox News call prompted a massive scramble on our part to get all the material up at big government right away. Somehow, we did. Fox News was going with it. The print media was teed up and big government was ready. All we could do now was wait. Acorn itself gave us our first little victory. Scott Levinson, Acorn's spokesman, responded to the regular airing of the Day One video on Fox by claiming that the portrayal is false. This film crew tried to pull this sham at other offices and failed. Perfect. So far, everyone was playing their roles, and really, what other defense could Levinson have used? It worked for us because we knew that Day 2's release, the DC video, would prove that Levinson and the Acorn leadership were either lying or painfully misinformed. There must have been some panicked strategy sessions and conference calls in the wake of the first video drop, but by the evening of day one, Acorn made its first attempt at damage control. They fired two of the lackeys in the Baltimore office. They were two part-time employees, said Baltimore Acorn chairwoman Sonia Merchant-Jones. One was a receptionist and the other was a part-time tax preparer. To her credit, Merchant-Jones perceived our strategy. It's no coincidence that this video was released after the president's speech. She may have understood our timing, but she and Acorn itself clearly thought that would end the story. Not quite. On Friday morning, we released the Washington, D.C. video. It was just as damning as the Baltimore video. By now, the Acorn tapes were pinging around the Internet, and Fox had the story in steady rotation. We knew that we were drawing blood when Acorn abandoned white spokesperson Scott Levinson in favor of the dashiki-clad African-American Bertha Lewis. Clearly, political correctness, the race card, and Alinsky were going to be their playbook, a tried-and-true defense. That day, Friday, I flew to Quincy, Illinois, for the 912 Tea Party. Right before we got on the airplane, I was informed that Acorn had fired two more employees in D.C. That wasn't a small thing. It meant that we had gotten our bam-bam. It was a double blow, an affirmation from Acorn that what they were seeing on the video was not only absolutely wrong, it was trouble for them. I still had the long flight cross-country. I was in the air for four and a half hours without internet access on our way to our stopover in St. Louis. That's my definition of hell, especially at a time when every minute counts, and the in-flight movie stars Ashton Kutcher. Then I got off the plane. There were 25 to 30 people waiting for me at the terminal, all carrying signs about the Acorn scandal. This wasn't my final stop. This was a stopover, and they were out there waiting for me to congratulate me. I didn't even know how they'd found me or what I was being congratulated for. Then somebody told me. The census had delinked from Acorn. Census Bureau Director Robert Groves wrote a letter to Acorn in which he explained that recent events concerning several local offices of Acorn have added to the worsening negative perceptions of Acorn and its affiliation with our partnership efforts. Census Bureau spokesman Stephen Buckner told the press, 
their affiliation caused sufficient concern with the general public that their continued participation would be a distraction from our mission and would maybe even be a discouragement to Americans participating. When we finally got to Quincy and the Tea Party itself, the crowd was raucous. At least a third of the signs were targeting Acorn. The story was exploding. It was clear that this wasn't just an A story. This was an A-plus story. Acorn's reaction had guaranteed us that. The political class was noticing the story, and the mainstream media could pretend not to notice, but the water was already up to their waists. When I listened to my voicemail, there was one from Sean Hannity. Andrew, he said, you need to come up to New York. I whispered to myself, wow, this thing just jumped another notch. For media types, despite all the talk of decentralizing the news business, including my own, the island of Manhattan remains the promised land. The major networks, Fox News, the other cable news outlets, the major news magazines, all remain cloistered together in this lefty hothouse dedicated to one-upmanship. Baltimore and D.C. are big towns, but the world pays attention to what happens in Manhattan, and for the acorn story to truly hit the stratosphere, to truly swamp ye old media, we would have to flood the Big Apple. Bertha Lewis certainly helped. She responded to the Day 2 drop by claiming that Hannah and James had been kicked out of Acorn's Los Angeles, Philadelphia, and New York offices. This recent scam, which was attempted in San Diego, Los Angeles, Miami, New York, Philadelphia, to name a few places, had failed for months before the results we've all recently seen, she responded on Fox. This was, quite simply, a lie, and now, with videos from all those locations in hand, we knew we had them. It was time to take this road show to Broadway. Lewis teed up the New York City video better than I could have imagined. With a pimp and prostitute photo in hand, disproving her assertion that the New York Acorn office had resisted James's pitch, I made a call to a top executive at the New York Post. By this point, the story was really gaining momentum, and I was feeling confident if I offered the print exclusive to the Post, they'd run the story the following Monday morning. They did it. And so, for two days, Monday and Tuesday, Hannah and James were plastered on the front page in newsstands across New York City, the stories inarguably disproving every defense Acorn was mustering. Talk about assaulting the old media? The story was now simply unavoidable. The smile on my face, hunkered in my secret Manhattan hotel like some new media seditionist, was from knowing that even in their townhouses and limousines, Pinch Soulsberger and Jonathan Klein and Katie Couric could ignore this no longer. While in retrospect, the acorn rollout appears, even to me, seamlessly choreographed and executed, in actuality, it was two of the craziest weeks of my life. If any of us got more than three hours sleep any night, I'd be surprised. It was all a roller coaster blur of travel, phone calls, emails, offers, pitches, and threats. The phone would ring, you'd answer it, and suddenly the story and our lives would keep accelerating. We held it together because we believed in what we were doing, believed that the people we were exposing were the tip of the corrupt, venal leftist spear for whom America was nothing more than a deserving victim. We also held it together because we had a special team. While I had already met James, I actually met Hannah Giles for the first time in New York. All three of us, James, Hannah, and I, were staying at the same hotel in different rooms. I could tell right away that we were going to get along. She was ebullient, a trooper to beat all troopers. She was immediately my friend and my fellow warrior, and even though twenty years separated us, I said to myself, I think this person understands what is going on here and can handle it. James was in a different boat. While we were blood brothers because of the story, James was a creative genius, but also a mess. He had to edit all the videos for release, often to different specifications for different news outlets, so if I was sleep-deprived during all this, James was a full-on zombie. As we pressed on all fronts, I was actually worried about his health. Hannah started going on TV and started to win over the audience. That was an X-factor we hadn't planned on, 
that the beautiful young woman playing a prostitute in the videos would come across as so poised, grounded, and mature on television. The first time Larry and I saw Hannah appearing on the Glenn Beck show, we turned to each other and said, This is masterful. Hannah played...